Welcome everybody and welcome people in Chicago. It is my great pleasure to introduce Karim Debault. He's a lecturer at the University of Bristol. He did his uh, undergraduate degree in philosophy and physics at Oxford and then went uh, to the big city, to London at the Imperial where he did an embassy in physics. Uh, after that, uh, he did his PhD in, at the University of Sydney, working with Dean Rickles uh, and Hugh Price, primarily, I think, right? And uh, has uh, been uh, a postdoc at, uh, in Munich at the LMU for a while uh, before coming to Bristol. We're very happy to have him here now, and he will be talking today as well as tomorrow, as a, a small announcement. Uh, tomorrow will be an, an analogical reasoning. To that today it's going to be on cosmic singularity resolution via quantum evolution. Thank you very much, and uh, please. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks for coming, and thanks for listening in Chicago. Um, so, so Chris mentioned that tomorrow I'll be talking a bit about a project in sort of analog, analog gravity. Uh, in a strange coincidence, this project, which on the surface never had anything to do with analog gravity, has started to connect with the other one, and that's one of the new things that I'll talk about that we're, we're very excited about right towards the end. Um, so this is a project it's, I've been working on since we were both PhD students with uh, Sean Gribb, who's a theoretical physicist, who's now in Bristol as well. Uh, we've written quite a, quite a lot of papers about um, arguing for a particular view of time and analyzing its consequences in kind of more technical and less technical terms. But this is perhaps the result we, 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 we're most excited about since the project started. And it's really about applying our way of thinking about time, the problem of time, to the simplest cosmological model, which is called really superspace. And we get some, I think, very interesting features, which I'll tell you a bit about later. But by way of motivation, I thought I'd start with Marcel Proust, uh, who says the following. We should not be able to tell the story of our relations with another, however little we knew him, without registering successive movements in our own life. Thus, every individual measured duration by the revolutions he had accomplished, not only around himself, but around others, and notably by the positions he had successfully occupied with relation to myself. Now, as well as being a master of literary modernism, Proust was also very prescient about the problem of time and quantum gravity. <laughs> In particular, the, the idea that we should, to understand the story of the relations between, uh, or to be able to tell a story about how relations change, we have to have some notion of succession. And so what, in a very broad and general metaphysical terms, you can distinguish three views on time in terms of their relative commitment to absolute structures, either encoding duration or succession. And so for those of you who are more technically minded, I mean this in a very precise sense, in that by duration, I mean there being a privileged temporal metric and by succession, I mean there being a monotonic parameterization. But we, they, they match quite naturally with our intuitive notions, so I won't labor that point too much. So if you think about one notion of time which has both, this is Newtonian time. We have a notion of duration, and we also have a notion of, of succession of ordering. Um, what I think is a very um, important and philosophically rich insight that comes mainly from Leibniz, but also from Marx, and uh, more recently from Julian Barber, is the idea that we should do away with duration, but retain some notion of succession, some kind of aggregate check, an uh, ordered aggregation of change that comes out of the change of relations. Um, so although we don't have temporal like, time in terms of its metric structure, we, we treat this as, a, a, as an abstraction. We do have some primitive notion of, of duration, sorry, of succession. And so the, the final, con I'm, I'm going to call that relational time. Uh, and there's actually some interesting connections, I think, to Leibniz's original uh, articulation of um, relationist views about time in, in the correspondence, but I won't be able to get into those today. The contrast class that, that's important is with the, an internal notion of time. Um, 
And this, this view doesn't have duration like the relational notion, but it also does away with succession. And this is really the idea that I think Carlo Rovelli has made most clear conceptually, and Bianca Dietrich has made most clear formally, that you can construct um, kind of partial and complete observables using purely internal clocks. And you can describe change using these internal clocks. And so it's not a fully, it's not really a timeless view in some senses. There's still a conceptual machinery to describe change, but it's an internal notion of change. And the particular feature, which actually causes some mathematical problem, is that because you're using an internal degree of freedom with your clock, there's no guarantee in fact generically you'll find it fails, the clock won't behave as a monotonic parameterizer, parameterizer of change. So when you're using an internal notion of time, a la Rovelli, you don't have a notion of absolute succession. So we have two, for our purposes, different metaphysics of time, uh, relational and internal. And they both have rich and interesting connections to people working uh, in philosophy and physics. When it comes to classical models of the universe, in particular, simple mini superspace models, which I'll explain to you a little bit about later, really it's just a very, very symmetrized version of the Friedman universe. Um, we have an undetermination problem. There's reasonable interpretations of these models, either in terms of relational time or internal time. It's perhaps not surprising we run into these metaphysical undetermination problems all over the place in science. Um, What's interesting about the situation is that the two views about the classical model have different heuristics. They motivate different procedures for how you can turn these models into quantum models. And this, is, in a sense, is, is the, the um, main point that Sean and I have been making in a series of papers. I won't belabor the, the details of, of why this is the case in this talk, but I'll refer to a, a number of papers where we go into a lot of detail later. But if you take my word for it, if you believe in the relational time view, it motivates a different way of quantizing, particularly this model, but in general. And if you believe in the internal time view, it motivates the traditional way of quantizing, which leads to something called the Wheel and Dewitt equation. Um, so you get you have a classical formalism that you can interpret in two different ways. And then depending on the choice you make, you end up with different quantum forms. And I think that's quite an interesting difference. Um, here what we want to show is that if you adopt the, the quantization that goes along with the relational time view, you get a better quantum model. You get a quantum model which has a number of features which make it mathematically and physically more interesting, reliable, uh, consistent than the model that you apply the internal. I'll give some details. The rest of the talk will be giving details to justify that, that claim. Um, in particular, what I'll do is talk a bit in quite general terms about singularity resolution. What is a singularity? What would it mean for a quantum theory to resolve it? This is actually philosophically a very interesting question. There's been far too little uh, discussion about um, what it means for a singularity to be resolved. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. So the, 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 probably, I think the best treatments are by physicists, in particular uh, Martin Bourgeois has written a very nice paper about this, this question. But I think for philosophers, it's actually quite uh, an open and interesting question. I'll give you the view that Sean and I are selling. But I'm sure there's many others that you could, you could, you could, you might be, be interested in justifying. The, the one that we sell, we think, is physically the most motivated. But I'll be very interested in. in whether you agree or not. So I'm going to talk a little bit about singularity resolution, give you a particular view, and just explain exactly why or in what terms our model is a, has singularity resolution. I'll then give you some details of the model before actually uh, unpacking the, how the, the world, the universe in which you live in, if you live in the model that, that we're advocating. Um, so it's probably worth, if there are any questions, stopping me, if, uh, particularly if they're technical ones, uh, and if there's some broader conceptual ones, maybe leaving this to the end. Uh, okay, so singularity resolution, what does this mean? What is a singularity? 
So we have these, these, kind of, these classical models um, and in the kind of exotic family of space times of uh, general relativity, there's a vast and interesting literature about what, singular, what it means to have singularity uh, and classifying different types of singularity. It's very, very interesting. And if you're interested in, in this kind of rich terrain, uh, a good starting point would be Eric Curiel's wonderful SCP article on this. Uh, thankfully, most of the odd and strange, difficult cases uh, aren't models that, that are kind of reasonable uh, for the universe as a whole. In particular, the Friedman universe um, has singularities in, in quite an unambiguous and well-defined sense. In particular, there's two notions of singularity that don't always coincide, but for this model they do. In particular, there's uh, the idea that you can have causal, i.e. non-space-like curves that are incomplete, that observers can traverse them in finite proper time. And you also have the notion of a curvature pathology. So there is some uh, kind of invariant quantities related to curvature that you could come up with a little device to measure them that diverge as the observer goes along their world line. And so generically, it's possible to have one of these, either of these about the other, which is a bit weird. In the Friedman universe, you get both. And there's some nice singularity uh, theorems about when you get these and what, 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 what um, features they have due to Hawking and Penrose. Um, in any case, the model that we're dealing with has both singularities in both senses. And in particular, the one that we, we uh, or the long and short of it is that you have classical physical quantities that aren't behaving in a mathematically reasonable way or physically reasonable way. There's some kind of pathology. And I think it isn't uh, too controversial to take these pathologies in the context of uh, classical cosmology to signal the breakdown of classical cosmology. And so the need for moving into uh, quantum cosmology comes as the model reaches a singularity. So what happens, right? So would, wouldn't, what, what would be the expectation? The expectation would be that the classical model breaks down, but some uh, you get divergent quantities. But if we quantize the model, uh, those quantities would be tamed. Somehow the, the, the quantum gravity model wouldn't have these, these uh, weird mathematical pathologies when approaching the singular region. Whereas uh, away from the singular region, we get this nice correspondence between the expectation values and the, oh my God, I'm foreshadowing myself a little bit. Um, I'll come back to that point. So this is the expectation, right? The expectation is singularity in classical physics, classical cosmology. We quantize the model. The singularity is, is resolved in some sense. Uh, that would be great. Interestingly, if you apply standard quantization techniques, i.e. the one motivated by internal time, to the to the, the simple cosmological models, which I'll give you a bit of details about later, um, you get the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, and as Ashtar has, has shown explicitly, at least with simple parameter values, you don't get resolution of the singularity. In that, the classical um, variables that were divergent, the expectation values of these variables are also divergent. So this is the notion of singularity, uh, uh, of failure of singularity resolution, I think. Uh, that if you have a classical variable and you find that in the quantum theory, the, sorry, the classical variable that is divergent as you approach singularity, and you find in the quantum theory that the expectation value corresponding to observable is also divergent, the singularity is not resolved. I think that's physically very reasonable. I'd be very interested if people disagree why. Um, so the singularity is unresolved, 
a simple class of models when you apply Willy DeWitt quantization. Now, Ashtakar is, of course, someone who believes in Willy DeWitt quantization, but he also believes in blue quantum cosmology. And this is one of the great achievements of blue quantum cosmology, is that if you apply um, Willy DeWitt quantization and you have some notion of fundamental discreteness, then you don't get the singularity. Um, so, explicitly you get the expectation values of classically divergent quantities uh, have finite values under a new quantum cosmological truth. So, in this sense, which I'm saying is the physically reasonable sense of singularity resolution, loop quantum cosmology resolves singularity in the model that I'm talking about. What I'm claiming today is that our methods have parity to loop quantum cosmology for this model, in that they have resolution in the same sense. They're different. They don't involve into a conversation. They don't involve fundamental discreteness. And it leads to different phys physics, which is very interesting. In particular, we don't have a frozen formalism because we keep this uh, notion of succession. We end up with um, a different methodology for quantization. We end up with something more like a Schrodinger equation for the universe. And we call, we've called this in various papers relational quantization. But I should note here that relational <coughs> quantization, as we formulated it, is only currently applicable to theories with global reparameterization symmetry i.e. Uh, to models with a single Hamiltonian constraint. So we don't have a, 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 a proposal concretely for how to apply this procedure to theories of revaluation variant. Um, so that's, that's a big limitation. I'm happy to talk about that more at, at, the, at the end as well, if you're interested. So what we do have, though, is for this simple model, mini superspace, we can apply relational quantization with any one Hamiltonian constraint, that works fine. The Big Bang is where singularity is resolved in exactly the same sense as, as the resolution I talked about for the quantum cosmology, because uh, we get finite expectation values for classically divergent quantities into and out, out of the singularity. Um, plus, we get some interesting phenomenology. Particularly interference between ingoing and outgoing eigenfunctions around the big bounce. And I'll show you some nice videos to give you a bit of a feeling for what it looks like. Strangely, interestingly, uh, make it what you will, we have superpositions of values of the cosmological constant. This is very different to, to, to the phenomenology of William DeWitt cosmology or, or um, Lou Quantum cosmology. So, you can't get two positions of, uh, of cosmological constant in, 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 in conventional approaches. Interestingly, this isn't uh, a novel, entirely novel proposal. This was done in the unimodular approach in, in the 1980s. And there's actually a very, very close mathematical similarity between the model that I'll present and a model that was derived by Unruh and Wald in 1989. Um, so that's something else that's quite interesting. Really interesting. Uh, and this is something that's only been, been properly worked out in the last month or so, uh, we find, as well as these wave functions that bounce out of the singularity, there's a class of wave functions, in fact those corresponding to negative cosmological constant, that are bound around the singularity. And they have mathematically the same form as some very interesting uh, kind of quantum uh, trimer states that are called Ephimov states. And I'll talk a little bit about what those are and, and what, how the correspondence works later on. So this is actually a, a Ephimov states uh, built out of three bosons that are weakly interacting. And they've actually done experiments to show that these states exist in nature. So if we're right, then there's actually a sense in which uh, these experiments that have already been done are actually analog models for the universe that we're proposing is, is our universe. Um, so this kind of gives a new platform for condensed matter quantum simulation of the universe. I think it's quite exciting and quite interesting. Okay, how am I doing for time, Chris? Um, very, very good.
20 minutes into the talk. Okay, so I'll, I won't go into every single detail of the model. Uh, I'm happy to, if people are interested in seeing the paper, which is almost ready, to share it with anyone who would like, uh, and they can go through everything in detail. Um, it's a really quite technical, it's become a really quite a technical project, and uh, Sean has done a huge amount of the work, so uh, I feel a little bit bad presenting his, his, his results about him here. Uh, in the end, the, the mathematics is very complicated, but the basic physical principles, I don't think, uh, rely on going through every single bit of mathematics, but I'm happy to go into to the details of the best of my abilities if you ask me. Um, so what is, what is mini superspace? Mini superspace is a lovely little toy model. Uh, and it's physically not completely mad, right? <coughs> it, is a, it is a model of GR. It has features that are in common with uh, reasonably accurate models of the universe we live in. So you take a homogeneous, isotropic, spatially flat FLRW universe, and then we take the simplest possible matter, right? Really, really simple, right? So a massless free scalar field. You're not really going to build a simpler model than this, but it's physically quite interesting. So what we're left with is just uh, two dynamical free degrees of freedom. We have the scale factor, which is the, ge the geometric degree of freedom, and we have the scalar field, which is the matter degree of freedom. And so I, 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 the technicalities of the model involve or require flipping between different representations of the variant of the coordinatization. And I'll, this will happen three or four times in the course of the, the rest of what will follow. But don't, don't, like, this is, don't let this kind of um, cloud out the simple physics of this, right? We have some spatial degree of freedom, which is this first attempt it was first uh, formulation A. We also use V, which is basically volume, and mu, which is an exponentiated version of, of the volume. But whenever you see these variables, just think A, V, mu, that's the, space, that's the ge geometric bit. And then the matter, uh, we use phi and we use var phi, I think they're the only two that we use. So there's a matter bit, there's a geometric bit. You can derive from the einstein hilbert action once you've done all, all, all the symmetrization, go for a canonical analysis, you can derive a Hamiltonian. A Hamiltonian has a, has a fairly simple form, um, which is up here. Um, it has squares of the momentum, of each of the, the variables, and it also has a cosmological constant part. Um, what's important from here? So the phi is in here. You see this? So the phi is a cyclic. Doesn't appear in Hamiltonian, which means it will be it will be a cyclic variable, which means that the relevant uh, momentum will be a constant constant of motion. Just get that from the oil ground equation, basically. So we have, we know that, that pi, pi phi, the momentum of the scale, the matter bit, its momentum will be conserved. So we know that just from the form of the equation. One of the crucial moves that we make, the relational quantization, our approach to time, crucially depends upon, is you, we also interpret the cosmological constant as a constant of motion, not a constant of nature. This is why we end up having super Right, so that's, that's basically all the detail you need, you need to think about, right? You have some dynamics, which is coming from the Einstein field equations. You have a geometric degree of freedom, a matter degree of freedom. You have two conserved quantities, one corresponding to the momentum and scalar field, one corresponding to the cosmological constant. We can rewrite everything. We're doing general relativity. These, 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 this is a coordinatization. This, this is a chart. We're doing general relativity, we can rewrite this all in a coordinate invariant way. Uh, in the end, this looks quite kind of scary. It's just, it's just a coordinate invariant way of rewriting this, where the two degrees, if we think about our configuration space of two degrees of freedom, we call them zero and one. 
I and J row, row, row over them. So we can write any any chart that we want to put on onto our uh, configuration space. We can write in this uh, uh, like without specifying. We can write the Hamiltonian as this group variable. This will help for transforming between variables later on. But and I suppose the most important point is that we can show that the singularities or the singularity is a property of the, the coordinate invariant representation. And that's important because we run into to singularities driven by coordinates all the time. So one important, or, so, so the fact that A is a geometric degree of freedom, we think about as the scale factor of the universe, it's Q, we think about as the volume, that's about like that's that's strictly positive. Well, it can be zero. Okay, it's uh, no, it's, it's, not, it's, it's confined to R plus, um, and this corresponds to introducing a boundary to, to the configuration term, configuration space. How we can do this coordinate invariantly? There's a boundary to the space. The space-time geodesics terminate in finite proper time and there's a curvature pathology. These were the two things that we needed for a singularity. We can show that you, this is a uh, kind of uh, well-known result. You can show that this model has singularity in this sense. Um, let's pick a chart. This one's quite uh, nice. And you can represent what's going on quite easily. Uh, so we split them up. Spatial volume, right? Over time, do you think time goes to minus infinity, way, 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 way distant past, uh, time goes on, the spatial volume, the universe is shrinking, and it shrinks to zero at some singular time. Usually, we just describe one of these branches, but the modeling contains both branches. The other branch, we start at the Big Bang, and we go play time going forward, and the model expands from zero up to up to uh, uh, an asymptotic value. Basically. So, so what's the yellow? Sorry, the yellow is the asymptotic value of the uh, okay. spatial volume. And so, if you think about what's happening to the scalar field at the same time, back at back at <coughs> minus a distant past, it's that's some asymptotic value, and then it, as you get towards the singular time, it shoots off to minus infinity from one branch. The other branch it comes out from minus infinity. Okay, so you can see why this is really, really odd. That you're basically shrinking the universe, the volume of the universe down to zero, and the scale of fields going off to infinity. So this is the this is the big bang or the big crunch. This, in a simple model, it has the Big Bang for a big crunch. Uh, you can represent it quite nice, not quite nicely. Um, as a kind of foreshadowing, for us, we get some, we get physics here, in between these two branches. And that's our, our kind of deep quantum regime, where we get very, very different phenomenology. It's kind of very interesting. And it's also where these strange FMR states live. Come back to that later. So this is, in a sense, technically the most important part of the talk. So, and I'm sorry, it gets a little bit abstract. So, uh, an operator is self-adjoining when not only its functional form is the same as its adjoint, but its domain is the same as its adjoint, which is a no one, no one told me that when I did physics, right? But it's an important mathematical property or requirement for self jointness that the domains of the, op of the operator and its have to match. Um, in this model, uh, the existence of the singular boundary leads to difficulties in finding representations of self joint operators because you get a mismatch between the operator and its domain. And there's a huge, complicated, and confusing literature 
analyzing cases of when you get failures of operators to be self-joint, and when, in what circumstances you can fix this problem using something called a self-joint extension, and in what cases you can't fix this problem. And there's a theorem of Stuttgart von Neumann, and it's a very long story. It isn't physically very enlightening, so I won't talk, talk about it unless no one's really that interested. From our perspective, the physically more enlightening and mathematically equivalent way of talking about it is in terms of the behavior of, 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 of the boundary. Uh, so the boundary allows uh, terms to contribute to the action of the adjoint. And self-adjointness requires that these, these terms vanish. And in fact, what you can do is just, if you take the, uh, this expression here, this is for the, for the adjoint, this is for the operator. Uh, when these two are equivalent, then the operator is self-adjoint. And so the, dis the behavior of this boundary term is what controls whether or not the operator is, is self-adjoint in the sense that its domain matches that of its adjoint. And this is really, really important because for those of you who, who are like, who cares about this stuff, self-adjointness is, is, is the property that guarantees unitarity, roughly. So if you want probability to be conserved, which you really do, you want to have self-adjoint operators. Um, Brian Roberts is actually doing some quite interesting work on the physics that you get when you don't get self-adjoint. I wouldn't want to dismiss it entirely, but at least conventionally, people are uh, quite, or physics is, or quantum physics is the, is the physics of self adjoint operators that have, particularly the Hamiltonians, will generate unitary time evolution. And so, this mathematical property, which has these, this connection to this, this boundary term, is actually very important for guaranteeing physical properties like conservation and probability. Yeah. Don't go for 30 minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, and so there's a problem that you get, and I, I won't go through all the details of this, it gets quite abstract. Um, representing the momentum operator in for this model, this well known problem, and uh, I'll skip over the details and I can come back to it if anyone's particularly interested. Did you want to ask something? Just going to read. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I, maybe I will say a little bit about it, because it's really, really interesting. Um, basically what happens is that the, um, for the geometric term, the transformation properties of the operator that generates shifts, which is the momentum operator, are different to the transformation properties of the boundary term. So you find that although we're supposed to be doing general relativity and everything's called invariant, different charts once you quantize them, behave differently. And this is very interesting and also very odd. Um, and so actually, there are some charts in which you can't quantize this model. There isn't a quantum theory. Um, and there are some charts in which you can quantize it and as well find quantum theory. Unsurprisingly, we, we will use the, the, the representations driven by the charts where we can represent our momentum operator. And in case you're wondering about the Stone von Neumann theorem, this is a finite dimensional model why are we getting equivalent representations? I didn't know this, but in fact, the Stone von Neumann theorem is formulated explicitly making reference to R2n as the phase space. Whereas our phase space is, at least, um, we can think about it as uh, R plus, or the cotangent bundle of R plus cross R. So the theorem actually doesn't apply to this, this model, uh, which is quite interesting. I, I would have just assumed that the theorem was formally coordinate invariant. Okay. So we, we find we, we use a particular chart that solves the problem of representing a momentum operator. Uh, and this is quite important. Using this chart is actually quite an important part of dealing with singularity as well. So we, we use a log a log like log variables which corresponds to a conformal completion of the phase so the configuration space. If we do this we have a well defined momentum operator we have self and we have self joint um, we have essentially self joint momentum operator. The Hamiltonian operator is not, still not self joint without uh, further steps, and that's, that's going to turn into the main point I'm going to make in the, in the rest of the talk. Um, okay, let's get to the interesting bit. So, why, why do I care so much? 
Well, there's a nice theorem by Ehrenfest that um, provided the Hamiltonian is essentially itself a joint, and we have a Schrodinger equation, we get singularity resolution in the sense that I, I, I care about, i.e. the um, expectation values are all, of all observables are always finite for free. I'll show you explicitly the, uh, the, the calculation of our expectation variables. But we know the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian is essentially as a Hamiltonian self joint, and we have a Schrodinger equation, which we do, then the operators, the, the expectation values, are going to behave well. So this is why this is such an important uh, part of our result. So we can define a Hamiltonian operator in this called the direct way if we want. Uh, this is basically quite like a Dylan version. The physics is also very, very similar to the, to the physics of the Klein Gordon equation. Lots of familiar mathematics comes up over and over again. Um, what we need to do then is find uh, solutions to the eigenvalue equation, where we have, so we have a Hamiltonian that generates time evolution, we do a separation, we have a Schrodinger equation, we separate, it's just like a normal Schrodinger equation, so we can separate out the time evolution. So all the wave functions I'm going to show you will, be, will evolve unitarily uh, like a normal Schrodinger equation as well. We obviously need to solve the energy eigenfunction just like you would in normal mechanics. Um, so we have the eigenvalue equation with uh, lambda, the cosmological constant, playing the role of the, of the energy eigenvalue. And to solve this, we split this into two parts. We have the phi dependence, which isn't physically that complicated. It's basically a wave, wave equation. And then we have the spatial dependence. I, I flashed through this before. V is just... Uh, Basically, the volume. Um, so I think it's. I'll show you. It's this here. It's the volume of a constant proportionality. And so, the so when we want to know the eigenvalues for our cosmological model, we have to solve a very nasty Bessel equation. Uh, by we, I mean Sean. By Sean, I mean Mathematica. Um, <laughs> No, he, he's done it analytically and numerically. Um, so there's a very nasty Bessel equation. It has imaginary orders. It's very, very weird, but it gives some kind of cool physics. Um, and that's what, what, what the main kind of meat of the model comes from. Um, in particular, what you find is that once you write the, uh, like, try and solve the equation, then there's two quite different families of solutions. So for negative cosmological constant, we get bound states. And for positive cosmological constant, we get unbound states. And for cosmological constant equals zero, you get physically and optically interesting states that essentially are the same as the we'll do it model. So we, we, we discounted those. And they don't really interact with the states that we do want to talk about. So I won't say anything more about that. Um, and so what, what is this? Well, what do I mean by a bound state? What, what is this F model effect that we're talking about? Um, so this is the really important thing. To solve the equation in a way that's self-adjoint, i.e. a way that will give us unitary time evolution, i.e. a, a way that will conserve probability, we have to introduce a dimensional parameter. What we're doing is actually extending the domain of the Hamiltonian so that the domain of the adjoint matches. This is called a self-adjoint extension. But physically what it means is actually the theory gains a new dimensional parameter. And what's really interesting is that, and what, what are these parameters? Good question, right? Uh, and I didn't really understand this very well if I read about this effect. The, the equation we're solving for these bound eigenstates is the same as that used uh, to model something called the F-model effect. And in that effect, the self-adjoint extension parameters have a natural physical interpretation. So by thinking about that effect, we can try and understand what we should think about these parameters in, in the cosmological model. So these are called the, the Ormian rings. You 
got, has anyone seen these before? So it's very cool. Watch it on YouTube. If you cut any of these, they'll all three will fall apart. So it was made, it was like a heraldic symbol made to symbolize the interlinking of these three families. But it's, it's interesting, like, topological, uh, mathematical thing that's been studied. You can think about the ephemeral state, or the ephemeral effect, as a quantum equivalent of this. So we have three uh, kind of weakly bound bosons, and they're only, they're only bound in virtue of all three of them being bound. You can't, if you take one out, the two will fly apart. A little bit like the four million rings. Mathematically, and this is the, the importance of the connection, you can actually model them at using an effective 1 over r squared potential. So you can model them using a Schrodinger equation using with a 1 over r squared potential, where r takes this form here. Uh, so the r is just dependent, so um, the r just depends, the big r just depends on the, the uh, couplings between pairs of the, uh, the bosons. So the mathematics ends up looking like 1 over r squared potential. And uh, it's not that we're modeling um, like we're modeling the effective physics given by these binary, purely binary couplings that leads to this bound trimer state. And this is quite uh, this is discovered by or mathematically discovered by Ethelwald in the 60s. First experiments to show that you can build these states were done in the last decade. What's interesting, or one of the things that's interesting about the ephemeral state is that, that you get a geometric series and the spectrum depends upon the self adjoint extension parameters. What are the self adjoint extension parameters? What they are is actually giving you physics, or they're basically telling you about the physics that isn't modeled, about the breakdown of the effective y of r squared. Um, treatment. So you can think about this, and people have, have written about this in this context, as something like a universal phenomenon, and you can think about the 1 over r squared theory as something like an effective field theory. Chris knows where I'm going. See, you can see, you can see. And then the idea is the parameters are remnants of the fundamental physics. So when the three bosons have a real Hamiltonian, a real, a real potential, isn't 1 over r squared. And the self-joint extension parameter that's picked out is about how that how the model breaks down into the fundamental physics. So why don't we do the same with, with our model? So for the negative cosmological constant, the v-dependent part, the volume-dependent part of the energy energy function is the same form as the f1 state. So we can think about our ground cosmologies and not analogous to f1 states in a sense. So we could actually un we could uh, speculate, claim, suggest that the self adjoint extension parameters that are showing up in our model are actually telling us about the fundamental physics, i.e., treat quantized general relativity as an effective field theory. And I think this is physically very plausible, and uh, it would would mean treating quantum gravity or quantized general relativity as not as a fundamental theory, and it would mean that there would have to be other physics that are not modeled, but I, I think it's, 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 it's quite a plausible, interesting, um, different way of thinking about, about uh, quantizing uh, cosmological work. How have we got that? Yeah. Five minutes or so? <laughs> okay. So what about the unbound states? The unbound states are also modeled by Bessel, Bessel's equation with a different form. Um, what, what, what kind of structure do they have? We'll do this bit by bit. But first we'll think about uh, a limit in which the scalar field is negligible, which corresponds roughly to a to city universe. And if we think about the, um, what do we care about? We care about the, the um, modulus squared of the wave function into and out of a singular region. That seems like that will give us the phenomenology of what's going on quite clearly. Um, and so this is the very nice mathematical uh, animation showing the big bounds. Um, can I click on the... 
Do you mind clicking? Just so you can see it again. Or should you just go back and forth? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. So you see this this plane here is where uh, the, the spatial degree of the geometric degree of freedom goes to zero. So this is the sing this is the singular singular region, and we set up the wave function in the Gaussian and bounce it off. So this is in the limit where the phi is negligible, just so you can see it a bit more simply. Um, and so as it gets to the singular region, you have some weird interference phenomena. At late times and early times, you have a Gaussian. Um, to give you even a nicer picture of it, um, we can plot this in 2D, just with wave function amplitude, you can't quite see it, this gray line here is the expectation value. And so, this again. The expectation value reaches a definite point, and there's some <coughs> super non classical interference, and then it bounces off again. So, this is the de Sitter limit of the model where the phi is not doing anything. What happens when we bring in phi? It's more difficult to represent things. Um, so, let's break it down again. If we think about the expectation value of, uh, sorry, I'm switching variables, v is, vo v is volume, roughly eight cubed. Uh, red is the classical value. Remember, we rescale things from four, but the classical value as, uh, at, at, at t equals zero goes down to zero, right? That's the thing, the, the big bang, the volume is zero. What happens to the expectation value of our V at the singular time, or the, the early time, it reaches a definite value. Singularity resolution in the sense that we've claimed. In the same, it might be, as, as we hope as well, whereas phi uh, diverges, uh, sorry, so again, red is, uh, classical value, blue is the expectation value, and whereas phi, the classical value diverges, the uh, expect expectation value in our model uh, doesn't diverge. It's, it's, it's bound, it's finite at all times. So physically, perhaps most fundamentally, what we want to talk about is the relational observables, so we can talk, we can actually plot them side by side, and so we can think about what, what's the uh, expectation value of phi and v, uh, or the change in relations of them at successive instants. That would be, I have to jump a bit. Uh, so early times, think up the board. Right, so this is uh, very, very early on in the universe. And then as the uh, we approach this, the the, the quantum region, the Big Bang region, the expectation value, uh, and the sorry, the classical value, the red value, and the expectation value uh, go apart because classical value behaves um, divergence, whereas our expectation value doesn't, and then they come back together again on the way out of the Big Bang. And so, interesting. The, there's something looking like an inflationary period around the Big Bang, which we're hoping to explore a bit, a bit more in, in, in future work. Um, then, final video, we can actually have a look at the, the full phenomenology of the model. Once again, so you can see the model comes in, you get this deep quantum region. Uh, so, if you go back to this curve here, in these regions, the expectation that the uh, wave function is roughly Gaussian around the expectation values. Whereas in this deep quantum region, it's doing all kind of weird stuff. There's, there's some very kind of structured physics going on around the singularity, um, which I think is a, a very interesting, interesting to explore this, this phenomenology. Okay, the general solution contains both bound and unbound states. Right? Because we, we're, we're allowed superpositions of eigen, eigenvalues of the cosmological constant, we can mix negative and positive ones. So we mix 
Now, I've known about the states. What does that mean? What's, what's the physics of that? This is a less flashy animation. Uh, so we think about the bound state sitting around the singularity in some sense, and the unbound state of some uh, of early time being, being very, uh, think about it, the unbound state at some early time is peaked way away from the singularity, and the bound state kind of sits around the singularity at all times. And what can we think about? We can think about the bound state bouncing off the unbound state like a scattering. And this is the really important point. The unbound states have self-adjoint extension parameters too. They have dimensional parameters. What are those supposed to be? The idea is that the unbound state bounces off the bound state where the singular, around the singular time and picks up a phase. And in late times, the, the phase for the, uh, of the unbound state will be somehow encode the, the deep quantum regime in, in, inside the unbound state. And what's really nice is this is exactly, well, not quite exactly, this is very close to what happens in the actual experiments that you use on the ethanol states. They shine a laser, a laser into the um, trimer state of the um, three bosons, and that picks up a phase which corresponds to the self free extension. So we would actually think about those experiments as an analogues to uh, slightly strange, bouncing the universal wave function off the singularity and pick, picking up a, a phase, or bouncing like, like parts of it off itself, in a sense. Um, so then this is the, the, the physics of the model. It's quite interesting. So the question is, does it correspond to the universe we live in? So in particular, could we think about the late time phase, or at late times, I mean, where now, we're nowhere near the singular region, there being some marks in our data of, the, of, of this, this phase shift, or of the, the, the phenomenology of the deep quantum regime of the state, and all these weird interference effects. It's unlikely that this model is rich enough to give us phenomenology. Our next step is we're going to look at uh, Bianchi models that have anisotropies, and we're very hopeful that we can get some. Uh, prediction down the model as well. Um, before I finish, uh, if you're interested in conceptual interpretive questions related to quantum cosmology, how would, would we try and approach them? Uh, we wrote a paper with Pete Evans called Science and Quantum Cosmology, making attempts to use some ideas from retrocausal quantum mechanics. If you're interested in uh, technicalities behind the stuff that we, we're doing, we wrote a paper called Trailing Revolution for the Universe, published in Classical Quantum Gravity, which has all technical results. And for the philosophical stuff, uh, we, we wrote a paper a few years ago called Time Remains. So those are going to be a good cross section. And we're also very happy to share the preprint of this as soon as it's, it's finished. Thanks very much. Okay, so uh, are there questions in Chicago? Could you explain, yeah, so could you explain a little bit more about the, uh, what about the isomorphic, um, ephemorphic thing? So just on a sort of basic level, uh, for, the, for the mini superspace, it looks like you have just a sort of two degrees of freedom like the, the size and the, the matter field. But in the epimorph, there seem to be three things, like three degrees of freedom, distances between them. Sure. So how do you get the three in the, sure. the model? OK, so, so, the, so sorry, I should have made that a lot clearer. So the connection is just between models with an effective 1 over r squared potential. So it's, the point is just that the ephemorph state, you can model it using a Schrodinger equation with a 1 over r squared potential. And you end up getting uh, the eigenvalue equation that you have to solve. You can do a ch uh, change of variables, which means that it's the same Bessel equation as we have. So it's, it's really just, uh, in terms of actually, it's actually very close to the, the way that 
um, Raji and Eric Winsberg and I have been talking about analog simulation, that there's a particular variable choice and way of massaging the differential equations so that the uh, equation for the FMOF state is isomorphic to one of the variable separation parts of the equation for our uh, Schrodinger, our, 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 our like energy eigenstates. So, so it's really just to do with the equation having the same form. So that, so the sense in which it's um, it's a simulation of it, or it's an analog model in the sense that it has the same mathematical structure. It's not an analog model in the sense that the features have a, have a, have a one to one correspondence in kind of in, in physical space. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Where to begin, maybe? Um, very general one. What's the main, could you summarize the main difference with the loop quadratic resolution of uh, the singularity in, in loop cosmology? Uh, uh, that was not something that I would be doing a particularly good job of. But from what I understand, um, the big difference, or, so I don't understand the mathematics precisely behind why they get set resolution in their model. Um, the, the big difference is that what they do, from my understanding, is use uh, a deparameterization of the model. And so, in particular, the big difference between our approach and the conventional approach is that we keep both all, all degrees of freedom are quantized, whereas the traditional approach would be to treat one of the degrees of freedom as a clock, it remains classical, and then you can describe the evolution of that in terms of the one you've kept as a classical clock. And this is where you get these monotonicity problems, because the thing that you've kept as a clock can start running back. So from what I understand, what the loop, loop quantum cosmology result is, is that you can take the expectation value of, I think it's A, and at different values of phi treated as a classical variable, and it will, the expectation value will always remain finite. And so Bojol talks a lot about this as a, um, a slightly different sense of singularity resolution. Um, I can't remember the name of. But I think we'd want to say that so far as it goes, if all you care about is singularity, re singularity resolution, the loop quantum result, loop quantum cosmology result, is as strong as our result, but for reasons that I can talk a lot about, we're not happy with the idea that you should treat one classical degree, of, uh, one degree of freedom as, as the, or keep it classically and, and in a sense not quantize its dynamics. Um, so, is that answer your question? Or is it? I don't know enough about the, the mechanics of what Bourgeois and, and Ashtagar do. Give you, to give you a really detailed comparison. Okay, that's a good sign that the technical is then, um, from the conceptual point of view, then the difference would be that they have this kind of, so this kind of internal time view, and you would keep this, you know, what you call the related or time view yeah. within this framework. So you have absolute succession and this yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, and so the, uh, the claim is that, uh, so far as it goes, if, if you want to stick with internal time, you, you have to use, introduce fundamental discreteness to avoid the singularity. If you just do a wheel of doit quantization without using loop, loop methods, you'll get the singularity will stay. Whereas we get, we resolve the singularity without using the, the loop methods. I want nothing against the loop methods. It's no, there's no reason why you couldn't use loop variables in our model as well if you want to. Um, I, I'm not sure, I would need to know a lot more about the technicalities of, of exactly why the fundamental discreteness res helps resolve the singularity to uh, make a serious claim. But it does seem that, perhaps unsurprisingly, if you introduce a fundamental scale that you don't get divergence in, in quantities. But uh, I, I, so I wouldn't want to claim our result stronger. I'd certainly claim it's different and it does as far as singularity resolution is concerned, 
the same, the same kind of positive stuff. Mm -hmm. But again, your main motivation is your view about time. Sure. All right. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. So, so the point is that if, 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 if you, all you want to do is control singularity uh, and you don't care about our view of, about time, then, I, then I, I would say you're free to pick, uh, to use the loop method. What's interesting is that we get different physics. So it's, the question is then which model is better for modeling the universe. So going to be empirically inequality. Yeah, yeah. So they would, they're, they're going to get um, different phenomenology around the big bounds, exactly because they've, they've treated one degree of freedom as a classical. Thank you. Uh, so one thing that they also claim they get, I forgot the details of that, is some sort of inflationary phase, or at least on some of the the models they're, they're developing. And you mentioned that as well, that you have something like an inflationary phase. I didn't quite understand so why and how it works. This is a kind of um, major point that needs to be developed further, okay. at least particularly in my own mind. I think the idea is that the char it's characteristic of inflation that um, the expectation phi dA is, is roughly zero. That's a like, characteristic of an inflationary phase. Mm -hmm. And because we get d expectation phi, d a is roughly zero at this. Um, you remember I drew the diagram? Oh, yes. Um, there's something that looks like inflation. But I really want to. So Sean has a lot to say about this. Uh, the, the difficulty at the moment is because he's working so quickly. For me to keep up with him, uh, I have to learn huge amounts of physics. So I think he's very, very convinced that there's a number of features that connect with contemporary cosmology, including inflation, something called the BKL conjecture. Uh, there's also uh, the, the, the sense of the role that scale plays in this is very interesting. Um, so the fact that a fundamental dimensionful parameter, sorry, a, a, a dimensionful parameter gets introduced uh, would actually break the scale of invariance of the model. Um, so there's some, a number of different connections, but I, wouldn't, I don't know if I should more. Uh, maybe another thing then is, so you, you have relational time, absolute succession, including in the quantum physics. So yeah. that stays, in that sense, you have time, some notion of time through the Big Bang. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so, so one thing that I, 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 I can talk about for a longer than I probably should, but I, I should at least say something, is that I was using a language constantly of before the Big Bang and after the Big Bang. Conceptually, this probably doesn't make any sense, right? We'd expect this to be all be time reversal and variant, and we wouldn't expect the arrow of time to go, I don't know if you can see me in, in, in Chicago, um, we need a little bit more of an angle. Um, so, if you think about the way I was talking about it, can you see? That? No, not quite. Probably not. Yeah. Maybe I, I can use it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm, use your arms. I'm yeah. actually going to do, do YMCA. Um, so if you think about uh, my left hand is the um, this one. I'll do this. My left hand is the distant past, and my right hand is the um, distant future, and my head unfortunately is the singularity, uh, or the Big Bang, classical singularity. The way I was talking, the universe goes like that, right? Actually this probably doesn't make much sense, right? What I think is really powerful is the way that uh, Julian Barber and collaborators have been thinking about a two-headed two universe, where you have two futures and one common past. And so the arrow of time will be orientated away from the Big Bang in both branches. So we could actually be in, we could be either of my wrists, basically. We could be in the late, late time phase in either of the two branches of the universe. And observers in either branch would be facing away from the, uh, the from their perspective, uh, the other, like, they're, they're, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. They're, they're a little bit like how, how Hugh Price thinks about uh, asymmetry of time, but, but in a sense mirrored. Because um, you'd have embedded observers who both have their own uh, local arrows of time pointing away from the Big Bang. So, so that, 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 I think that's conceptually how I would think about 
um, about the kind of bouncing phenomenology. It's not like uh, no physicists would actually see a bounce, right? They, 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 all they see is uh, a big bang. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you say that uh, the people like Julian Barber and people around him have come up with, with this idea as well, because it's certainly something that I think uh, is a natural thought when you look at loop quantum cosmology because there, because you don't have relational time if you want, only internal time, you start to ask yourself what is time really, and in particular in that deep quantum phase uh, around the Big Bang, it's, does it really make sense to have a sort of time, as it were, clock and show in one direction through that phase? It seems not. Most likely yeah. it's, it's more like the, the birth of Twin universes, or uh, so I think. If if, if Carlo Rovelli was here, he'd probably shout at me a bit, and he would certainly not think the. He certainly doesn't think we should retain succession. He he does have a slightly yeah. different view to the mainstream because he has this idea about keeping the partial observ what he calls the partial observables around, which are actually correspond to our our, our complete observables. But I think our picture doesn't have, sorry Chris, uh, emergence of time in, in that the sense that most of the quantum gravity programs do, right? So I think, um, although, if we treat this as an effective field theory model, then it's really saying that the, that the deep structure isn't even in quantized general relativity, it's something even, even kind of deeper down than that. Yeah. Um, so, so I think the, the the framework does have emergent time in the sense of the notions of duration and orientation in time would be emergent. But the temporal succession is in the framework from start to finish, which I think would be a different from certainly how someone like Ravelli would talk about loop quantum gravity, where the, the quantum regime doesn't, there's a sense which you might describe it as, as non temporal. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's relevant, but I'm wondering, um, is there anything special about um, um, relational quantization from a technical point of view, or is it more a conceptual starting point which makes different so, kind of approach to quantization? So, the special thing that's te technically important is it really, really resolves, revolves around, in the way we've formulated it thus far, having a single Hamiltonian constraint. And it, we've, we've done this actually far too many times, we've done it in four different ways, but in one of the early ways that we did it, what you do is actually enlarge your phase space by introducing a, a particular variable that's canonically conjugate to the Hamiltonian, that has this special role in the theory. Um, and then you, you apply so that you can then apply Dirac quantization to that, to that enlarged model. Yeah. Um, and so, it basically result, revolves around a trick, or a technique, or a, as we want to call it, of um, deciding whether the restriction which corresponds to, in, in simple models, the energy being constrained to an energy, uh, vanishing energy hypersurface uh, in phase space, whether you treat that as a fundamental, like a restriction on, 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 on like the kinematics, or you treat it as a, a dynamical restriction and allow that variable to play a role in the theory. And so the problem is that in theories with infinite family of Hamiltonian constraints like general relativity, you don't have a, uh, a, a natural set of variables that you can introduce. In fact, um, I think a large part of the 1980s was spent by people looking a way to do this, particularly Aishin and Kukash, try to find a way to pick out this variable, natural family of deparameterizations that you could use. And so one thing you can do is introduce dust fields. People do that when you deparameterize them. I think mean, physically it's a bit weird. Um, the thing that I, I, I think is quite interesting and reasonable is what you can do is switch to shape dynamics. And so in shape dynamics, you rewrite the constraints so that the Hamilton, or you, you actually do a um, reformulation of general relativity so that you don't have the infinite family of Hamiltonian constraints. You have one, 
you have a fixed variation, but you have the 3D conformal invariance, and you have the same degree of freedom count. And in that context, at least in principle, you could apply our, 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 our relational quantization. I might say one more thing, uh, if, it's, if anyone's interested, is that the latest idea we've had is actually to try and if we wanted to make the theory conformally invariant, i.e. remove the dependence on fundamental on the, the, a dimension full parameter that gets introduced, i.e. self joint extension, to fit in with the kind of philosophy of shape dynamics and of like kind of Julian Barber style physics, one idea is that you can actually we could actually integrate over the self joint extension parameter. And this, the thing that's interesting or, 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 or odd about doing this is, from the looks of it, what you get is actually, uh, you get dissipation, and you get non-unitary evolution. And actually what the people working on shape, the full frontal shape dynamics are doing, is exactly looking into the classes and models of these features as well. So there might be quite a nice connection between um, the role of, uh, scale of fundamental physics and the role of, in a sense, um, conservation of probability and conservation of entropy. So there's some interesting and odd connections to, to explore the future. Do you, have you ever thought of um, trying to look at the root with your tools at the black holes? No, no we haven't. Um, okay. That would be quite interesting. I, 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 it could be something Ask Sean what he thinks. Um, so I know that Klaus Kiefer does that in his book on, on cosmology. Mm -hmm. Shows similar singularity results. Yes, yeah, so, so the, the Boyerwald and Dashta kind of yeah. have also looked at some black hole models and, and tried to. And, and of course, the anisotropy studies said are going to be the next step for you. So try to sort of see uh, using their techniques uh, in a number of cases. Yeah. And uh, they're very confident that uh, what they have is, is, is a, will, will resolve generically, quite generically, the singularities in all those cases. Sure. sure. So, so I think we'd probably be confident as well because of the Ehrenfest theorem. The, in a sense, like, like the loop quantum gravity guys, or loop quantum cosmology guys, have everything much harder than us. Because we're using the familiar Schrodinger type quantum formalism, we've got a hundred years of really, really nice, solid results to fall back on. So I think the Ehrenfest the theorem uh, should give us something pretty generic, so long as we have a self joint Hamiltonian and Schrodinger equation our expectation values are going to remain finite. But I, I would have to think more of it if, that, if, we could, if I could turn that, that kind of um, intuition into something more solid. We've come more or less to the end of our time. OK, Nick has another question. Nick, if you want to tell us a little more about the dimension of the parameter that comes yeah. into the theory, uh, are you sure it isn't a like a measure of discreteness? I mean, it seems like it could show up in some sort of uncertainty relation that made you think that it was a minimum length or something like that. I mean, it's more you've said, I guess. I'm just yeah. About I, that. I, so that, in a sense, like I'd have to look at the effort. Like, so maybe I'll we'll say a little bit more about it, right? So, in in the very very small literature on self joint extensions in philosophy of um, physics, which includes, I think, one paper by John Ehrman, uh, people generally treat the self joint extensions as a, as, a, as a cause of indeterminacy, as a problem. Uh, and that's quite interesting. And I had some discussions with um, Laura Ritchie about them, Ritchie about them. And um, one, of the, one of the worries is that in many of the situations where you get self joint extensions, you may assumptions about very odd systems. So the simplest system of self-joint extensions is just the particle default conduct uh, with a one-sided infinite potential barrier. And so you, you pick up a phase from the barrier. Um, but so it isn't clear what that physically that phase is corresponding to. 
What's nice about the FTMOD state is that the extension parameter is coming out of something in the, the physics of the, uh, the, the bosons that you've already got. That might, in that case, I'm not sure whether it is fundamental discreteness. And it might, in our case, plausibly be some kind of uh, parameter coming from a, a minimum length. Uh, that, that's, quite, that's an interesting suggestion. I certainly wouldn't want to rule it out. Hi. Are there any more questions in Chicago? No, I think we're good. Thanks. Maybe, maybe I have one time time for one more. Okay, well in that case, thank you very much again.